services. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to our schools today at Torwood, Hampton Oaks and College San Pantrecio. This is your very own school drive. I can't wait to have... Oh, I hit myself in the head. All the questions possible from you. Now, we can hear some birds making noise here. We think there could be some leopards close by. So we're tracking big cats on foot. There were also lions in this area. So please send me through your questions. My name is Brent Nosmith. I have Craig on camera. We've got Herbie. You might see behind me on security patrol. But we're going to try find these leopards and this is safari live ready standing by So we think these big cats are very close to us. There's, we're just looking for tracks and sign wherever there's a bit of open ground. There we go, look at this. Ooh, here's a lion track. So there's been lions here. We know they were here this morning. And those lion tracks, it's quite difficult to see, but there's one, two, three, four toes. There's the back pad. And that track is heading south. Now, there were leopard and lion in this area this morning. So, hopefully we manage to find one of them. Let's check carefully around here. Leopards are really good at camouflage. They could be lying five meters from us. Isn't this really exciting? We're looking for two of the biggest, most dangerous cats in the world, on foot, live in Africa. Ricardo would like to know where exactly in Africa are we? Ricardo, we're in the Greater Kruger National Park in a reserve called the Sabi Sands Game Reserve on a particular property called Juma, Juma Private Game Reserve. And we're in the northeastern part of South Africa. When looking for leopards, when it's hot like this, it's about 80, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We sometimes look up in the trees, see if we can see a tail hanging down, because when it's hot and humid, the leopards often like to sleep in the tree. There's a bit more of a breeze up there, and they get away from the biting flies. Miss Monica would like to know, am I afraid of lions? Miss Monica, I'm afraid of nothing when I've got my stick. No, I'm joking. I have a very, very healthy respect for lions and I understand their behavior very well, but I'm not at all afraid of lions. I'm not afraid of any of the animals out here, elephants, lions, buffalo, but I have a respect for them and a lot of t I've spent a lot of time with them over the years. I'm very fortunate. I've grown up in the African bush and I've been doing this since I was very young. So not fear, but respect. And I'll never take a chance with an animal because that's how you get into trouble. But speaking about one of the most dangerous animals to encounter on foot, Jamie's found one. Let's go have a look. the most dangerous animal to encounter on foot and of course an animal that most definitely is very scared of lions. Look at this, on a hot afternoon we've encountered a pair of buffalo bulls who've decided that the best way to spend today is having a swim. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm quite jealous actually. They look as though they're having a wonderful time sloshing about in the water. Oh, just a very quick introduction. My name is Jamie. This afternoon, Dave is on camera with me. Hello, Dave. Hello. And a very warm welcome to all of the schools joining us this afternoon. I hope you are super excited to be out on safari. Remember, what you're seeing is happening right here and right now. 
excuse me, which means I've breathed in my water the wrong way earlier. Oh, he's a great big buffalo, as Brent told you, can be very dangerous animals. So we're quite happy to sit and view them from the vehicle, but they tend to be quite, oh, look at that, his whole face went into the water. having such a good time. They can be quite foul-tempered and unpleasant to encounter on foot and that's just because they don't see very well and they're absolutely massive. So one of these big buffalo bulls could maybe even reach 900 or so kilograms. So just under 2,000 pounds in weight. Well let's say 1,600 pounds. So they can get absolutely huge. I don't think it was water, I think it was a fly I swallowed. Like I've got some, thank you. <laughs> Let's just try and ease its passage down my throat <laughs> and out of my trachea. Now, Paul, you want to know if buffalo bulls are dangerous? Yes, Paul, they are dangerous. As we spoke about earlier, they are very fast, very heavy, and they tend to be quite grumpy. And even a lion has to be careful when they hunt them. And generally, you'll find that it takes several different lions combined to actually bring down one of these massive buffalo bulls. Sorry, just hold on one second. Brent's just trying to get hold of me. Oh, never mind, Taylor's got it. Now Liam, you want to know how long a buffalo can live. Liam, not much older than its mid-teens. So a 10-year-old buffalo is starting to get quite old, and by 14, 15, that is a really ancient buffalo, and they usually don't live that long out here, just because there are lions that are constantly looking for a big buffalo meal, and the older animals tend to be a weaker and easier target. Sorry, just hold on one second, I just wanted to chat to Brent. Uh, Brent, there's a two-track that's running off Rebecca's, you know the one from yesterday. I left them in a Maruda tree quite close to Rebecca's road itself. That two-track that runs to the north of Rebecca's road, they were probably about maybe 50 meters in, in a Maruda tree. I could see the road from where I was. No, negative, not, not that far. Sorry, I was just helping Brent out. I know he's keen to find things on foot for you. And since I was the last person with the leopard cubs this morning, I just wanted to help him out. So we all work together as a team out here to find the different animals. And we control the way in which we do that by communicating over radio. So we can all chat to each other and plan out where we're going to go. And also try and help each other when we are searching for animals. We got lucky though. And actually that was my plan for today. Because it is such a warm afternoon and there's so much water around, I'm going searching for swimming animals or in the case of these buffalo, wallowing animals because there's lots of different creatures that like to come and spend time either in the water or around it. So I'm thinking elephants maybe having a swim and these buffalo were a nice way to start off our theme for the afternoon. We might see frogs. We're just going to go and check all of the water sources that we can get to the big puddles in the road. Now this particular puddle was actually made by a combination of the efforts of these buffalo and the elephants who would come in here and wallow in the mud. Now Darcia, you want to know how often do buffalo go swimming? They don't actually, to, to be completely honest with you, I'm giving an incorrect impression, they don't actually go swimming swimming unless they have to. They really just go to wallow, so they go and they lay down in the water or in the thick mud to help themselves cool down. So that it depends on how hot it is, how often they do it. So if it's a really hot day like today, then there's a good chance that you're going to find most buffalo, particularly the bull, 
bulls, less so with the breeding herds, but these older gentlemen who move off on their own and are known as dugger boys or mud boys, there's a very good chance in an afternoon that is as hot as this afternoon is, that they are going to go and find themselves a nice wallow pool to lie down in and it just helps to get rid of the ticks it helps rid of, to get rid of the parasites and it also helps to cool them down and when you're that big and you have such a dark coat you can imagine that they feel the heat <coughs> I'll see you were wondering if it is very hot today I think that the the weather station that we get fed the temperatures from is broken because apparently it's 29 degrees centigrade which is just 84 degrees Fahrenheit but I don't believe that because sitting in the Sun look we are sitting in the Sun I would say it's probably over 86 degrees Fahrenheit probably closer to 90 and it's also quite humid so we've had lots of rain recently which is wonderful because it keeps the grass nice and green and it makes all of these wonderful puddles for things like buffalo to a lion but it does mean that it's quite humid. It's quite a sweaty afternoon, isn't it, Dave? It is. Uh, I'm going to carry on and search for more creatures that are enjoying the water. While we do that, let's go and see what Taylor's plan is for the afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, we've made it out again. It's myself, Taylor, and then on camera with me this fine sunny day is Brian and a hay fever thumb. The two of them seem to be battling it out and having a competition to see who can do the most sneezes today. <laughs> There he is. You can see we're all sneezing out here. I know Herbie was sneezing this morning. There must be something in the grass. Maybe it's the dust that's kicking up at the moment. Who knows? But we're still going to go out and have lots of fun. And I've got a little surprise for all of you in stall, especially for all the children who have joined us from the various schools today. And I hope you're excited. We are going to try and locate a male leopard, which we had found early this morning. So he went, he was walking, marking his territory, he was giving a call, he was because that's the sound that a leopard makes. He was rasping, telling all the other leopards that this is his territory, this is where he lives, nobody must come and try and steal his home. And he was also spraying urine He was against the trees, which is a way, another way that they mark their territories. But then he sat down. Then he decided he had a full belly and that it was getting a little bit too hot to carry on walking during the middle of the day. So he went and laid down. Colton, you've just given me goosebumps with your question. You're wondering if I enjoy being a safari guide and how can you become one? It is the easiest thing to do. If you want to drive guests around and from all over the world and take them on safari, the best thing to do is maybe when, once you have finished school, finished high school, you come down to South Africa and you do an environmental training course. So we have these schools which you go to learn about the bush. So not a, a college or a university, it's a very special kind of training. And you can do it within a couple of months. You get your, your first qualification, so you write some exams, you, you go and you spend a few months learning about everything and then you do a practical game drive and then you get different levels so you can become more and more experienced at your uh, at your quality uh, in your industry and it's lots and lots of fun so I really recommend that you come and do this especially if you like people it's the best job in the world you've got to absolutely love people out here unfortunately it's not just about the animals we're gonna send you across now to Brent I'm not sure what he's got but you've seen he's walking around and anything could surprise him well, we found a young male leopard on foot uh, he's probably about 15 meters from us at the moment under a tree you can see that all the grass has been flattened around there while he's been sleeping now his name is Hosanna which means the little prince isn't this exciting one of Africa's big cats on foot now I don't know where his sister is yet and I've been trying to have a look around because she could be quite close so what happens is their mom We'll leave them in an area where they've got water, a nice safe tree to climb to get away from lions, and she goes off hunting. And only when she's caught something will she come back here and she'll start calling. She'll go, ow, ow, and 
call them and then they'll run to her and then she'll lead them back to where there's a kill. Now they're quite dependent on their mother or young males till they're about two years old. Oh look, look, he's looking at some birds that have found him. You can hear them, they're upset that there's a leopard here, the little uh, white helmet shrikes. Okay, let's just... Now Katie's wondering, oh, you can see there's birds fluttering about him, we can't really see them because they're moving quite quickly, but he can see them. Kaylee's wondering, how do leopards hide so well? Well, Kaylee, they're designed to hide very well. We can see that incredible spotted pattern that's on them breaks up their outline. So if they keep still like that, uh, unless you're being <laughs> very careful um, about spotting them, they just disappear. Now, this is very, very special, and there's very few places in Africa, or leopards in Africa, you can actually stand next to a leopard and and enjoy his company normally they will run away or sneak off now this little leopard i've known since he was about six inches long so i've known him since the day he was born and uh, i was uh, the first person to ever see see them after they were born him and his sister and and we've spent a lot of time habituating them on foot and on vehicles. Now the interesting thing about leopards on foot like this is that it only really works at this age. Um, once they get a bit older they have that sort of natural fear of man and of all sorts of stuff that's, that's hundreds of thousands of years of evolution have bred into them. So they will they will become more f scared once they become independent from their mother. Now, so their mother is actually also a fantastic female to, to track on foot and we spend a lot of time with her. Alyssa is wondering how big do leopards get? Well Alyssa, he probably weighs about 130 pounds, 140, no maybe not as much, maybe 120 pounds at the moment and a big adult male leopard will weigh as much as 200 pounds, so about the same weight as me. Now of course they are incredibly strong. Now they're capable of carrying more than their body weight up a tree, 20, 30 feet up a tree. Marianne is wondering how do I know if this is a male or a female uh, by his size. So as a male who's just over a year old, he's a year and two months old now, uh, he's already bigger than his mom. I'm pretty sure his little sister's around here somewhere. Let's go. It's just so. What I've done is I've, I've he knows we're here, so I haven't gone any closer. I've sat and I've talked and I've got him used to the sound. Now we're going to take a few steps closer. Oop, watch out for the branch, Craig. And we should be able to see his face quite clearly. Okay, just watch your footing here, Craig. There's some broken branches. Just keep coming towards me. There you go. Massimo is wondering what do leopards eat. They eat meat, Massimo. They're a carnivore. They eat antelope, impala, dica, stanbok. So small to medium sized antelope. A big adult male can even take big animals like a kudu. So they can eat up to, or something that weighs much more than them, up to 300 pounds. They can catch something that big. Hello little man. Where's your sister hiding? I'm sure she's very close by. She's probably watching us at this very moment. Alyssa is wondering how many leopard cubs does a mom usually have? The normal amount is two, Alyssa, sometimes one, very seldom more than two. And it is already a really big job uh, feeding two cubs because now she's got to catch enough food to feed herself plus both her cubs. So it, it is two is the normal number. Hey little man. Hello Hosanna. He is so beautiful. Yes, you are. I wonder if he knows how good looking he is.
Kareem is wondering how long do leopards sleep every day? Now, they're very good at sleeping. They probably sleep between 16 and 18 hours a day. At this age, they sleep a little bit less, but they'll rest like he's doing now. You can see his eyes seem to be getting a little bit heavy and he's, he's getting a little bit tired. He might have a snooze shortly. Hey, little man. Suleiman would like to know, do leopards only use their camouflage to hide? Well, Suleiman, they also use it when they're hunting. So they can, well, I suppose it is a form of hunting, so they can sneak up really, really close to to an impala or, or another type of antelope, and they can jump on them. So that, that it is a form of hiding, and also as a form of protection against other predators. Uh, they can hide and disappear and merge with the bush. Hey, little boy. Well, we're going to sit here. We might go look for his sister for a little bit, uh, see if she's around. She might be sleeping in a tree close by or on the ground like he is. While we do that, let's go see how Taylor's doing. We're not having much luck, unfortunately. We were looking for Hosanna's father, which was the big male leopard that I was telling you about, but he seems to have moved off from where we found him this morning. And the problem that we have at the moment is that, as you've seen with Brent, is that the grass is so long, anything can completely disappear in that grass. So we're searching desperately at the moment for him. Where do you, where do you think he's gone, Brian? Oh, I don't know. Down here. Nothing down there, or we can go this way. What do you think? Let's play a game. Which way would you like me to go? Should I go left or should I go right? So quickly send uh, it into your teachers which way you think I should go. And the first person to shout out the answer, left or right, that's the way I'll go. So I'm just going to sit patiently now and wait for you. So, Demon, you're wondering how big is this area that we're in at the moment? It's actually quite massive. You'll be so surprised. So, in total, this wilderness area, so when I say wilderness area, I mean uh, that it is not open uh, to the pub. Like, nobody can just come driving in here. You have to get a special permit. You have to pay a conservation fee, and then you can only enter the park. It is over 8.5 million acres of land. But the areas that we are in, because we are in a, a private sector, so you have to stay at one of the lodges to come and drive down over here. Well, this is about 130,000 acres of land and the animals have got to roam around. And so it's really, really big. This area is bigger than some countries. And then we've got a small section of land. We've got certain properties that we can drive around on as well. And we're on one of them at the moment. We're driving on Juma. And I'm still waiting to see which way we must go, left or right. And then we also drive on Cheetah Plains. I think Jamie's actually going to go to Cheetah Plains. It's beautiful down there and we can drive on Chitwa Chitwa as well as Arethusa. So we've got many many areas. Oh look the mongoose have just popped out. Maybe that's a sign. Maybe we should go left. Ah all the school or well, uh, San Patricio you said that I should go right so we'll go right but we'll have a quick look at this mongoose. Now this is the smallest carnivore that we have in the area. So a carnivore is something that eats meat. And these guys eat a lot of different things. They eat insects. They'll even catch snakes if they can. But they are tiny. So they are called dwarf mongoose and very shy as you can imagine because they're little. They're probably the length of your ruler. Maybe just shorter than the length of your ruler. Very very small. So if you pick it up on your table that's as big as that. So that's why they're so scared. They don't want to hang around in the open because there are lots of eagles and things that fly around here that will swoop down and snatch them up and eat them. And we don't want that. But that's a lovely little sight. Oh they're back again. Look at them. You see they're coming out again. Maybe they're feeding on termites or something that's in the road. Hey, they're so quick. They're like little, they almost look like squirrels, I suppose. And there's a whole family that's living around there. And there's a bird. That bird is called an African hoopoe. And the sound that it makes is whoop, 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 whoop. That wasn't a very good hoopoe call, but that's where it gets its name from, is because of its call. Ah, Louise says a not very good call. There it is. 
medicine, you're wondering why is the grass so long? Look at the little mongoose. I wonder if it's going to chase the bird. No, it doesn't seem to mind it. Because we're in summer at the moment and we've had so much rain. Madison, if you saw what this area looked like maybe three or four months ago, you would be completely shocked. It was like a desert. So what the road looks like, all sandy, that is what the whole area looked like. Not even the trees had leaves on them. It was very sad for all of the animals. We were experiencing one of the worst droughts we'd had in a hundred years. But luckily, we're back in business again. We've had lots and lots of rain. Alessandra, you're wondering if dwarf mongoose are like squirrels. I'm going to go back to the right just now. I want to go and see if we can get a better look at these mongoose. Uh, not, not really. I suppose you could say mongoose is more close to a ferret. I'm sure you know what a ferret is. They're really, really small. We get many different kinds of mongoose out here in the bush. This one being the smallest one that we have in Africa. And then you get... I can hear them. I can hear them. Let's see if we can hear them talking. There they are. They're alarming. They're shouting at us. They're telling everybody, all the other animals, all the birds, they're just there somewhere in the long grass. Let me see if I can call them. So watch to see if any heads pop up out of the grass. There's one, there's one. Look. Dabs, you're wondering what is a mongoose's predators? You see there's one moving around over there, just quite interested in us. Let me do it again. So they've got many, many predators. Snakes, so even though a mongoose can eat a snake and they'll all gang up on a snake, they will unfortunately maybe by a python, actually any snake or a spitting cobra or a puff adder, they'll eat them and then the birds, the eagles and the goshawks, they will all go for something like this. There's one to the right in the, just by the base of that silver cluster leaf, they're running around over there somewhere but it is very very difficult to spot them in all of this long grass which is actually good because it helps them hide away a little bit. You can imagine when we don't have lots of rain and there isn't much grass about, they are very 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 vulnerable to being eaten. So that's why they run so quickly. They don't want to wait. But it seems as though we're not having very much luck with them. They don't want to be seen today. That's okay. Should we carry on? So San Patricio School said that we want, we want, us, want me to go right. So let's do that. We'll turn around and we will go to the right and hopefully we'll find something. Emma, hello to you. Lovely lady. Now you're wondering what is my favorite animal on the reserve and Emma I really hope that we can find them for you today But my favorite animal is an elephant. I love the largest mammal in, in a land mammal in the world They are incredibly intelligent. They're so clever when you sit and you watch them and they're really really funny You know sometimes if you sit with a herd of elephants you think to yourself Oh, they're acting they're behaving like me and my brother do when the little ones play about all the time It is really funny and you saw Jamie with a buffalo that were having a mud wallow Well elephants like to do something like that too. They'll take their trunk Trunks, suck up the muddy water and completely spray themselves with it and sometimes if you're close enough you can end up getting sprayed with mud too so that's what we'll do as well we'll check around here there's lots of mud wallows and perhaps we'll get lucky and we will find some elephants too but no sign of this leopard yet I haven't seen any of his tracks he could just be in the thicker vegetation which would really make it difficult for us to find him but maybe maybe we'll be lucky today I have a feeling we'll be lucky Liam, you're wondering if leopards are smart. I think so. I think anything that is able to plan a hunt, so they are making strategic movements, and specific movements, and <coughs> able to read their prey's behavior, I think that they must be a certain type of intelligent. Not, not intelligent like us as humans, but something a little bit different. The only thing is though, is if a leopard or a lion sees its reflection in a window because sometimes they come right up to the lodges and walk past the lodges and if they walk past a sliding door, glass door, if they see that they do get quite a fright which is, which is normally not a sign that they're intelligent. They're just seeing themselves for the first time and often they'll react by attacking the glass window because they think that it's another lion or another leopard right next to them. So they're not quite as intelligent as us as humans, we know when we've seen our reflection. 
Oh, no leopards just yet. Luckily you managed to see one with Brent. Colton, you're wondering how do you... <coughs> Sorry, Colton. Uh, you're wondering how do you tell the difference between animal tracks? By studying is probably the best way and by going out every single day. If we find a nice sandy area, this area is not great for tracking because of all the rain, everything is still quite compact, but we'll go check a few areas or if we find a very muddy area, we'll have a look at some different footprints. Uh, let me see if I can see any here. The sand gets a little bit softer. No, you see this road that we're on now that we're checking is a very, very busy road. Lots of cars come up and down over here. So it's not easy to see the footprints, but we'll keep looking. Maybe we'll go check the watering holes, like I said, if we don't have any luck here with Tingana, or Sana's dad, and then we'll change our plan. Maybe we'll find him a little bit later. We're going to keep searching hard, Brian, and I've got our eyes peeled for anything that will move. Let's go back across to Brent and see how Hosanna is reacting to him on foot. Well, Hosanna's doing just fine. He's got a nice bit of shade. Uh, we're still sitting uh, a little bit closer than we were, but he's now gone fast asleep. He's put his head down. Oh, there his head pops up again. But he's very, very relaxed with our presence. We can hear some... We went and had a look a little bit to the west of where we are for his sister. But we can hear a sister killer, which is a tiny little bird. And it's alarm calling incessantly. So we think his sister is probably about 50 or 60 meters that way. Now, they'll stay close to each other. They don't always stay together. So she, there's also a little puddle of water down there. So she might have gone down there for a drink. But this is very, very special to be able to sit this close to a male leopard. Hey, Mr. Mr. Hosanna. What you doing? Kayla is wondering, can leopards see when they are first born? They can't, Kayla. They are what you call an altricial animal. Now that means they are born blind and helpless and completely dependent on their mothers, uh, just like human beings. And the opposite of that is an, like an antelope or a deer. They are called precocial animals. The babies are born as miniature versions of the adults that are able to run within a few minutes of being born. Oh, I thought, are well, you going to climb the tree for us? It would be very nice if you did. No, I think he's quite comfortable there. This is incredibly special. Oh, no, he's just... What's he seen? What have you seen, Osana? Now, sometimes, what these little males do is they decide it's a game and they might try to stalk us or well, he could be stalking his sister, his sister could be lying in the thicket there there could be a bird there could be a, a a rodent wouldn't this be spectacular if we managed to see a leopard catch something on foot who've given up now Ricky is wondering how do leopards hunt their prey? Well, by being very, very sneaky. So, they're capable of incredible speeds over short distances. So, you can do about 24 meters per second. And at 24 meters per second is generally from under 5 meters. So, he'll go flat on his tummy and he'll sneak right up to whatever he wants to eat before he jumps on it. Now, here he goes. He just leapt through. Let's, let's go through here quickly. He could be going to his sister. I'm just going to go very, very carefully now. Okay, you okay, Craig? I oh, know he's stopped. He's just gone to find a bit more shade. Now you can see how well a leopard's camouflage works. He just moved off 
to have a little bit more shade. So you can you can barely see him now. He's just sleeping in the shade there. And he's watching us. No, not watching us. Have you come have you got him there, Craig? Okay. Well he's gonna go into that that thick area. It's getting hot. That's why he moved from where he was. You can see he's got some nice shade there now. So I think we'll leave him sleeping here. We're gonna go see if we can find his sister. Now Suleiman is wondering, do animals stay in specific parts of the park? Um, seasonally. And these leopards are staying in this area because their mom left them here two days ago while she's gone off hunting. But as soon as she comes back, they'll leave with her and hopefully she's caught them a nice big impala. Now even though their mom, they're mostly reliant on their mom for food, uh, they will still hunt little things around them like rabbits, or sorry, hares and rodents and rats, squirrels, mice, dwarf mongoose. Okay, so we're going to leave him. We can't really see him in the thicket there. He's going to be nice and relaxed. We're going to go see if his sister's sitting somewhere more open. And then we might go see if we can find some lions on foot next because there were lions in this area. So while we do that, let's go see what Taylor's up to. We're watching an impala, which is a very common antelope around here. I thought he's, he is going to disappear. He's going back to hide away in some bushes. He's all on his own. So he's starting to develop a territory for himself, where so he'll mark and defend it. And hopefully some ladies a little bit later will come and find him. Oh, look at that. Well spotted, Brian. This is a very pretty bird known as a lilac-breasted roller sitting up on top of the tree. You can see it is very, very beautiful and it's calling. Have a listen to its sound that it makes. Every time. I say let's listen to their calls, they stop calling. This is what happens when you're out here. Here we go. Nope, not wanting to call, but they are very chatty birds. They're often shouting about, very much like the leopard did this morning, just telling everybody that this area is taken. But they're amazing birds. You must see them when they fly around in the sky and catch insects. They do the most incredible acrobatics in the sky and sometimes you have to be very patient out here in nature. If you sit long enough, you're able to witness all these amazing things. But for now, it's not ready to go flying just yet. It is just scanning the area and I'm sure once it sees a couple of insects buzzing about, it will fly on down and try. Ah, there it is, not shouting. Did you hear that? Isn't that cool? It's a funny sound, hey? He doesn't have a very, very pretty voice. And he doesn't need to have a pretty voice either because look how beautiful the feathers are on this bird. So that is the way that this bird will attract females is by doing sort of very fancy flying movements, almost like I said, like an acrobat in the sky. And then it dazzles the females with its beautiful lilac feathers and brown feathers and blue feathers. It is very, very pretty. Look at that bright white eyebrow as well. It must be one of the prettiest birds that we see all year round. Hello, and it's sitting in a very thorny tree too. It's amazing how these animals can move around in vegetation that's got lots and lots of thorns on them without getting pricked. Because I think if I were to try and climb that tree, I'd get stabbed quite a bit by all of those sharp thorns. Hello, beautiful bird. Now we still haven't had much luck with Tingana. I don't know where he's gone. I'm sure he's just been moving from shade to shade. He, Like I said, he had a very big belly, so I can't imagine he would have gone too far. And there have been no tracks just yet. So what we are trying to do is we're doing a circle around where we last saw him this morning. And if there are no tracks coming out, he's probably still lying in there. Suleiman, you're wondering what does that bird, that roller that we just saw eat? 
insects, butterflies, grasshoppers, you name it, dung beetles, all sorts of types of insects. And I saw a very interesting photo the other day that popped up on the internet of a lilac breasted roller eating a baby bird, which is very unusual. We'd call it a nestling. It didn't have any feathers on yet, it had probably just hatched out of its egg. So they can be quite sort of savage birds too. But out here in the rawest nature, it's very, very tough. Everybody wants to eat everything and it's really only the strongest and the fittest animals survive out here. Can you imagine constantly looking around you like this, listening out for animals that potentially want to eat you? Tallwood, all the, well, all the lovely children at Tallwood, you're wondering if that bird has got such a brightly colored feathers, how does it hide away from predators? Well, it's able to fly very, very quickly. So what it will most likely do is out try and outmaneuver another bird that's trying to catch it. So an eagle, something along those lines, a goshawk might come for a bird like that. But like I said, that's a quick one and it'll be a very, very difficult bird to catch. So normally, when you see different, the smaller eagles as well as the goshawks and, and the various, the, the buzzards, all of them, if they do catch birds, they'll catch doves because doves aren't able to fly as quickly and do the sharp maneuvers like a fighter pilot would be able to do. So it's easy for them to catch. And that's what they do. Anything that is a predator out here, whether it be a bird, whether it be an insect or a frog or a mammal, whatever it may be, they're going to try and go for the easiest possible meal that they can get. So for instance, with leopards and lions, if they perhaps see an impala or a buffalo or any animal that is injured, and if it's living in a herd or even if it's by itself, they're going to try and go for that one. Because it means that they won't be using as much energy as they would use use for, for a fit and healthy animal so it helps them out a bit and the most important thing out in the bush is not to utilize all of your energy in one go you've got to save it Parker are you wondering if we have a lot of pretty birds here we do Parker we are so lucky we are very 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 lucky with the amount of birds we actually saw an amazing bird this morning we saw the largest heron in the world and I shall show you a photo let me see if I, I just want to park in the shade so we don't get the glare from the sun. But it was caught, hang on, oh no, these are leopard tracks. Hang on, Park, I'll get to your question now. Oh, maybe they were hyena, no, they were hyena tracks. But they've been driven over. Right, let me show you a photo of a Goliath heron. Where is my mobile phone? So my, I've got a very cool app on my phone that uh, tells me about all the different birds I can even play you their call so we'll quickly go on to here we go to H for heron find heron now we need to look for Goliath I think it's somewhere here there it is so I sh I'm gonna quickly just find a nice picture which is a good one that's a goodie and I'll turn it over look at that look how beautiful it is and it was fishing maybe we'll actually go and try and find it because I'm sure you'd want to see the world's largest heron not only the biggest heron here in South Africa but it is massive really 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 tall I reckon that this bird may even be taller than some of you but we're gonna head maybe down in that t direction I think Tingan is fast asleep and uh, he'll probably only come out a little bit later so we'll try our luck down there maybe we find some elephant but Jamie's been driving a very very far distance now I think she's got to cheetah plains let's go and see where she is we have indeed got Shichita Plains, a place where even more rain has fallen than Juma, which is where Taylor and Brent are at the moment. And that's why I've come all the way here to go and have a look at their water holes and see whether or not we can't find. I'm dreaming of elephants swimming. I really want to see an elephant having a lovely time in the water hole. And you've arrived at the perfect time, the perfect moment, because we're just about to come round the corner to a place, confusingly enough, called Juma Dam on Cheetah Plains. Not to be confused with Juma the place. Okay, let's see what's here. The last time I was here, there was some hippo. There were some happy elephants swimming. That's still around the next corner, not this one. Whoops. 
thought I was closer than I was. Here we go. What are we going to see when we go over this hill and round this corner? That's the question. There could even be lions hiding next to the waterhole on a nice hot day like today. Let's see. Where there's nothing. How sad. Let's have a look and see if there really is nothing. And hello to Trinity. Trinity, you want to know if we find a hurt animal, do we go and keep it safe somewhere? Is there anybody home? Trinity, it depends. If it's an animal that has been hurt by a human being, then yes, absolutely we would. So let's say something got really unlucky and found itself with a snare around its leg, or perhaps something had been shot, then Absolutely, we would go and help or maybe it was sick because a disease had come in from outside of the reserve then absolutely we will help but if it's a natural injury if for example it's a buffalo that's been hunted by lions and it's been injured but managed to escape then unfortunately we can't step in and we can't help because nature has a way of balancing everything so <coughs> It's a way of keeping numbers down and also making sure that the strongest animals are the ones that survive and pass on their genes and reproduce. So we don't interfere with nature. She's been doing this for far longer than we have and protecting herself for far longer than we have. All we do is make sure that she's able to do that. So we keep out any poachers, we keep out any hunters and we make sure that nature can do her thing without us interrupting her. Unfortunately, there's nothing here. I was so hoping that before you had to go back to class you would be able to see something but everything's hiding away this afternoon. So I'm going to say goodbye to all of the schools that have joined us. I hope you have a fantastic school day and that we see you again. For the rest of you, you can travel all the way back to Juma to the Leopards on Foot with Brent. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have left those leopards in foot, but it looks like Taylor's coming to go look at them from the vehicle. Is that why you're here? Uh, no, I'm not, but I can. I can oh, no. I'm just to. joking. You don't have to do that. So Mike's gone in there now. Okay. Um, you're looking for Tingana still? I did. He's moved from his last spot though, but I haven't seen any of his tracks coming out on Triple M. He was, um, you know, the um, brown ivory tree? Ah, just yes. Just that mud well, you'll see there's an off-road track going right, and then he was under a big bush willow, but he's not there. Not so there. I think maybe, he's not Maybe he's sleeping in that little drainage line yeah, there. Um, do you see any lion tracks? No, nothing. So the, I wonder where those lionesses have gone. So we had tracks of them coming south oh, okay. in the block here and we're wondering if they'd maybe cut west back towards where the rest of the pride were. Maybe. Uh, I didn't check, I didn't see anything obvious but there's been a lot of vehicle activity up there. I couldn't even yeah. see anything. Okay, well so what's your plan? I think I'd like to go and show them the world's largest heron. I'm going to go and check oh, the twin dance. Oh, very nice. I'm quite jealous. Find that bird, yeah. I'm going to have to look tomorrow morning. Yes. And oh, maybe cool. a fish eagle because there was one down there and hopefully some elephants bashing around. Okay, well, very good. Well, we're going to try and find some okay. lions. Good luck. Bye. Oh, hi, Brian. <laughs> Killer bees. Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it's quite difficult sometimes to see tracks while you're on the vehicle. That's why we quite often have a lot more success in finding animals on foot. So I think we're going to check carefully up this road, see if we can find any tracks of those lionesses crossing. I don't think they've gone down there. What do you think, Herb? Yeah, I also agree. I think they've gone this way. So we might, we're going to walk up towards Zoe's road, make sure there's no tracks going over here, uh, and maybe just check Zoe's carefully again. It's on foot, um, and especially with two of us, Herbie and myself, both with our eyes really focused on trying to find the tracks. Hopefully we'll have a bit of luck, and maybe we can do it again. Two big cats in a drive. Craig, you were with me last time as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Craig, Craig is a man of very few words. But uh, he is actually excited. He's smiling, but he's trying to pretend he's not excited. But I'm excited to try possibly get lion and leopard on foot again. Okay. And it's cooled down a little bit, so that's quite nice. 
Hi Colleen, Colleen is wondering which big cats live the longest. Well out of our three big cat species here, leopards will live the longest. Uh, generally your solitary cats will survive longer than animals that live in a pride, and, but uh, leopards will live generally the longest, uh, females to 15 or 16 years old, sometimes a little bit longer with, uh, with males living 12 to 14. And it's very similar with, with lions, except that the, the they tend to just not, not last as long as the leopards, maybe by a year or so. Okay, nice soft sand. So we're just trying to look for even the slightest mark of a lioness crossing. And of course, we are live in the bush, so you never know. We might bump into some elephants, we might bump into some buffalo, we might bump into a snake, and uh, hopefully we bump into those lions we're looking for. Remember, hashtag Safari Live uh, if you want to get hold of us. Hi, Jeff. Uh, Jeff is wondering, how do we stay so calm while in such pro close proximity to big cats? Well, Jeff, you know, your nerves of steel. No, I'm joking. Uh, it's experience, Jeff. Um, both Herbie and myself. How long have you been tracking for Herbs? 17 years. 17 years. Um, I've been working professionally in the bush for about 15 years. I guarantee you the first time I walked into a big cat on foot, I was not that calm. I'll actually tell you about the first time I ever walked into a leopard. Uh, and uh, <laughs> there's some words that I'll leave out that came out of my mouth afterwards. But I was, it was the first time by myself. The first time I walked into lions with my dad, I was about five or six. Um, and obviously with da my dad, you feel a lot calmer. But the first time <laughs> I walked into a leopard on foot by myself uh, was a female that had two cubs and uh, in an area where there are no habituated leopards, so they're not relaxed. Um, it is in a farming area in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, we had a family game farm, but areas around us, cattle farms and stuff, leopards were still considered vermin and were shot and stuff, so they didn't have the best of time. But off I went. It was about 5.30 in the morning. I had my fishing rod with me and I was trying to get to one of my favorite yellow fishing spots on the farm and to get there you had to go through this really thick riverine forest to get to this head of a rapid on the Mgani River and it was very misty at the time so I was not really concentrating so it's not re on the family farm sort of you don't in, in the middle of the Natal Midlands you don't really expect to find leopards that often I mean we used to see their tracks and find kills uh, see them once or twice at night with a spotlight but off I went to go fishing and had my fishing rod head down I had an orange for breakfast and off I was walking and that first growl yes Whatever it was is probably the most bone-chilling sound I've ever heard in my life. It was sort of a and I didn't even see her and she charged me from about six, six meters away. She stopped at about two meters and just all this dirt hit my shins and I was and I didn't even know what I was doing. I was fiddling with a fishing rod and then she went again and she was gone. And that was the end of my fishing. I literally went straight back to where I'd parked the car. So, sorry, don't drive when you're 14 years old uh, unless you're on a farm and you have permission from your parents. <laughs> but so, I went straight back to where I parked the car, put my fishing rod back in the car, and I was shaking so much. It took me about 45 minutes before I could actually just drive the vehicle back home. And then of course I woke up my dad and my grandpa and they said, oh, nonsense, nonsense. You got a fright from a bush pig, man. Wah, 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 wah. So I took them all back there and we went back and we found the tracks of that female leopard with two cubs. We actually saw her a couple of times with a spotlight after that. But yes, no, I wasn't that calm, Jeff, on the first time I walked into a leopard on foot. But that's what I say, but I've, I've been very, very, very lucky that I've been able to have those experiences from a young age and gain the experience I have, and uh, that's why I'm so calm now. But <laughs> let's go see how Jamie's faring down on Cheetah Plains. I think we're all very lucky to have experiences with big cats on foot. Uh, I've been racking my brains trying to think what my first on foot experience was with a big cat and I honestly I can't think what my first sighting was I think 
It must have been when I was in the Kalahari. And it was lions in the Kalahari. That must have been then. That was beautiful, by the way. So much water around Cheetah Plains. No, it was, it was. It was lions in the Kalahari and then Cheetah. It's been quite a bit of time walking with one of the male Cheetah there. I think that was the first time. Darby was just telling me, Dave was just telling me about um, his first time walking big cats on foot. And it was with Scotty who, for our new viewers, was a presenter here, fantastic guide, and his girlfriend Nikki was one of our directors. And we missed them loads, but they moved on to other adventures up in East Africa. And Scott took Dave out on tracking team with him, and Dave actually saw the lions before he did, and Dave said his heart was pounding. It was the first time he'd been on a bushwalk. Well, one of the first times. And your heart does pound in the beginning until you get to sort of understand and the, the reactions and know what sort of reactions to expect. That was also back when the Nkuhumas were quite relaxed on foot. Oh, there we go. Lou says Scott also work, walked her into her first big cat on foot. Lou, what was that? Which big cat was it? Ah, quarantine. Back when quarantine used to spend a bit more time on Juma, I imagine. Ah, oh, Scott, we miss you. Sometimes Nikki watches as well. We miss you too, Nikki. Lots and lots. Oh, we're just coming up to three in a row pan, and I'm continuing on my theme of checking water holes. And my plan is to finish off at Chitwa Dam. Not finish off, but get sort of the last one will be Chitra Dam <clears throat> before it starts to get dark. I'm <coughs> still in the hope that I'm going to find a swimming elephant, but I can't even find an elephant track, a fresh elephant track. There's nothing around. They've all vanished again. We've got some impala at three in a row. Hello, boys. Look how healthy and gorgeous they're looking. The height of summer. And the animals just look so pristine. And none more so than an impala, because they're so fastidious about their grooming that you actually don't really see them covered in ticks or anything like that. Hello, boys. You are truly looking absolutely gorgeous. So their aim over the next month or so is to bulk up as much as possible, be as healthy as possible, so that when the rut comes, they are able to compete. I don't think we appreciate how beautiful impala are because we see them so often. Hello, boys. What else have we got? Ooh. Oh, the lovely thing is seeing these animals looking so healthy because this time last year, and as we got further into winter, they were not. Even the impala were looking thin, and the impala are sort of consummate survivors. And Tanya, you want to know if we've had enough water to survive the dry, the dry season, or the winter? Yes, I think we do. I honestly feel as though we do. There's so much water around. Look, it might start, the water levels might start to get a little bit low towards the end, towards October, that's common, that's normal, but at least there'll be food. The grass is just so much better. I'm just looking at this blacksmith lapwing. They did used to have a baby here, and I'm trying to see, I've been dying to see how it's going, but I haven't seen it in a little while. They're chirping away protectively, as though it might be hiding somewhere here, but the grass has got so long and so thick and they immediately run for cover that I don't know where it might be. It must surely have fledged by now properly. It must be larger than when we last, it must be much larger than when we last saw it. They do grow so quickly and the last time I saw it was a good month ago. And lapwings are the master of distraction. If any predator comes near their offspring, is that it there? No, that's a dove. Oh, <laughs> false alarm. Everybody calm down. It's just a dove. 
And Lou Hu says it might be the adopted child of the lapwings. Oh, I guess not. Oh, there, was, there were two doves there. One was a laughing dove, one was a ring-necked or a Cape turtle dove. What, I was, oh yes, I remember what I was talking about. Uh, lapwings are the masters of distraction. If there's a threat to their offspring, they'll make lots of noise. They'll come running to distract the predator and run in front of it and try and draw its attention away. And they've even been known to practice the bo broken wing trick that a lot of adult birds do. If there's a predator in the area, they pretend to be injured and attract the attention. So they kind of drag their wing behind them so that they look vulnerable to predators. And they like, just like that, they draw them away from their babies. And lapwings do the same thing. That's one pan with some birds. Let's see what's at the next one. Keep a close eye out for the baby at the same time. There's the second lapwing. What have we got here? Sorry? We've got some ducks. Well, some Egyptian geese to give them their... Oh, <laughs> panic. There we go, the Egyptian geese waddling along. One of the noisiest birds. We spoke, we had a conversation the other morning about some of the noisiest birds that we get out here. Right now the lapwings are putting in some serious competition, but Egyptian geese can also make a fierce sound. And the worst part is often when you find that you're walking, I don't know, I've walked along a river before and they seem to follow us and alert absolutely everything that we were coming. Tannis, you want to know what made me decide to become a guide? It's always a difficult question because it's I've wanted to be in this kind of environment for as long as I can remember and apparently when I was two years old I sat up in bed and told my mom I wanted to be a vet. That was what I wanted to do. Um, being a vet didn't work out so well. I do I, I would have been fine with wild animals but I am very allergic especially to things like horses. So at 18 years old, I gave up that dream, which was very foolish. However, I can't regret it because look at all of the exciting things that have happened now. And when I was about eight, I went to a place called the Rhino Park, which is in the Waterberg, which is owned by a guy called Clive Walker, who is a quite a renowned conservationist, particularly where rhino are concerned. And I got to walk the rhino, and I got to feed one of them by hand, and that was me done. And I decided, no, if I don't manage to be a vet, I'm going to be a guide instead. And there's very few people in the world, really, if you think about it, who actually manage to get their childhood dream of what they want to be. So I'm very, very fortunate in having had that option. even on quiet afternoons like this afternoon. It was worth it though. We haven't come to Cheetah Plains for a while and nobody else has checked around here just because there's been so much rain. So it's nice to get on top of what's happening around here. Not much is the answer at three in a row pan. <laughs> Let us continue onwards. Maybe we'll see some cheetah on the Mala Mala boundary. Let's go and have a look. It's the next water hole to check. I'm also sort of hoping that we might see the corn crake that Brent saw. I've never seen one, so I'm dying to check that off my list. So that's something else I'm thinking about searching for. I don't know whether Brent had any luck the other day when he came through to Cheetah Plains. No? Pardon? Oh, are you with him? No luck, according to Dave. Okay, we'll check Cheetah Plains pan first and then we'll make our way south. And then across to, as Brent calls it, Luck de Bouf, Buffalo Pan. Buffalo Pan has burst its banks, so apparently there's hardly any water left, which is really quite devastating because it was one of the prettiest spots on this reserve. It really truly was. Ah, 
and hello to a Pokemon guy. Pokemon guy, you want to know why we don't see more Cheetah on Drive? Are they quite elusive cats? Yes to the elusive, but actually also because the population is quite a bit smaller than we still look, we still have the greatest meta population in Africa of cheetah out here. But it's still quite a small population and they also have absolutely massive home ranges, even the males. So a female has such a massive home range that she's almost essentially nomadic. And the males have massive territories. And the only times we really get to see this pair of males is when they walk their patrol route through Cheetah Plains and then they go through Torchwood north into Bilfils Hook and north into Manuleti. So they cover enormous distances and we only really get to see them when we get lucky and they happen to be coming through here which they do about roughly every two weeks although obviously it differs from time to time. So it is slightly more difficult with cheetah because you don't have such a high concentration. Whereas with our leopards, their territories in comparison to cheetah are much smaller and they're much easier to find because they stay in a similar area. Whereas cheetah keep us guessing. And otherwise, if we do see a cheetah on drive, it's kind of just pure luck. Just one that happens to be wandering around in our traverse area. And some of them are skittish as well. There's a male that did for a while spend a bit more time on Juma, but he was so skittish that we hardly ever got to see him and when we did track him down he'd run away. I'm going to search for cheetah and other such elusive cats. In the meantime let's find out what Taylor's been up to. We haven't really been having too much luck sadly. We gave a really good bash to see, oh hang on, before I get going here, let's go into 4x4 because this is a very eroded spot here. I actually haven't driven on Mamba Road for a very long time since we've had the rains. There we go, just needed to get up and over that. So as I was saying, haven't had much luck just yet with Tingana. We really did look. I think he's just sitting in, uh, in the thicket and it's impossible uh, to get in there because there's a bit of a seep line and you'll get stuck. It's so muddy and I don't want to go and, and go and make a big mess of the roads and all the vegetation there. It's unnecessary. So we'll just wait a bit later. It's cooling down lovely this afternoon. You can really feel that the season is changing today. This morning, firstly, very nippy. I was shivering. I was so cold this morning. Then warmed up to a beautiful hot day. But now these days are not as boiling as what they normally are right until the end of the show. Already now it's beautiful and pleasant. I'm not sure what the temperature is right now. It feels maybe about between maybe 27 degrees Celsius. So what's that? About 70, 70 odd? Oh, 28 and 83. 83, okay, that's mm, impressive still. It doesn't feel as hot. So there's also not so much humidity. It's a bit, <clears throat> a bit cooler. So that's quite nice. So slowly but surely winter is definitely on the approach. But I thought we'd come and check around here. And, and this road doesn't look like it's been driven in ages. I can't even see a tire track on this road. It's smooth, 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 smooth. It's actually really beautiful. So if anything has walked here, uh, we should be able to tell. <coughs> you can even see like all the grass is so long. Normally it's kept quite short by the vehicles consistently driving over it. And then we, uh, I don't know if anybody's gone to check around Voyatella and Gallego Lodge because throughout the whole day the monkeys were going ballistic. Sort of about an hour after game drive this morning, after the sun, sun's rise safari. So I don't know who's been lying in the bushes. Oh, quick link, we're going to go across to Brent. Guys, we've just found those lionesses. They apparently, after we left, chased Hosan and Shingile. They've escaped, but we've just found those Nkoma lionesses now. It's very, very thick. Very thick in here. We're not going to go any closer. Can you see them, Craig? Okay, just come forward a bit. There she is there. In that dark, in that dark, dark section there. Do you see the movement just to the left? No. Okay, so you see the, where there's the dark three branches? Just to the left, that's where the lionesses are. Come, we think we've got a better view here, Craig. 
there she is, she's, she's looking straight at us. So there's a little window through, through those bushes there and you can see her looking straight at us. So guys, we're not going to approach lions any closer on foot. It's a very different animal to a leopard. But there we go. Well done, Craig. Second time in a row with Craig and myself, Ngaila, lion and leopard on foot. Let me just call these guys in who are looking for them. Mike, Mike and, or Alan come in. Right. Yeah, we've located the lions on foot. Um, if you come further north from where I left you with the leopards, I will stand by until someone gets here to take over the sighting. Okay, copy that sprint. Um, yeah, uh, that sounds about right. I'm basically opposite you, um, heading down towards the drainage. I've just heard some uh, uh, alarm call from uh, Crest. Okay, isn't this amazing? We are probably 30 or 40 meters from the lionesses. They don't know we can see them, so they're not unaware. That's why normally in this circumstance they would probably run away. Now, if we had to... Turning right to go down next to uh, the drainage line. Push back in the... Sorry, uh, it, <laughs> guys are a bit lost. I'll talk to them in a second. But, as you can see, a, if we had to try and move a bit further forward, the most likely outcome is that these lines would run off. But if we stay here, and hopefully one of the game drive vehicles can get here, and then we can move on and go see if we can find Osana and Shingile again. I'm watching us. Herbie? Herbie? So Herbie just moved a little bit and that lioness watched him and, and, and moved there. So Rachel's wondering how we even spotted it. So you're looking for the outline. So just the shape of the ears and, and the head as she pops her head out of the grass and watches us. Look at that. She's looking straight at us. So she doesn't know, or she doesn't think we can see her. And we, the way we're behaving is we're not pointing too much in that direction. We're not acting like we've seen her. We're acting like we're sort of just chilling, you know, hanging about. Craig's quite good at that normally, just chilling. Now, there were two lionesses, so there could only, I didn't see, did you see two? I only saw one. I only saw one, so there could be another lioness around us somewhere. Okay, well, I'm going to guide the game drives in here while we do that. Let's go see Jamie, who's got a grey tusked creature. How exciting is that? Two big cat sightings on foot. Well, we've got something almost as exciting. Almost, not quite. An entire family of very relaxed warthog. Five little piglets, all wandering out of the thick, lush grass of Cheetah Plains in front of us. Hello little ones. Oh, you grow so quickly. Look at the little tufts of fur on the side of their faces, meant to look as though they've got tusks. It doesn't really serve to make them look very threatening, does it, Dave? No. They are very cute. I think baby warthogs are some... Okay, there's not many baby animals that one would not describe as cute, but I think baby warthogs are utterly adorable. Especially that one. <laughs> that little boy that's so focused on whatever he's after there that he hasn't realised the rest of them have left him behind. Off you trot. Oh, you must be living pretty at the moment. So much nice, fresh, green food. Because, of course, warthogs don't actually live on insects, despite what the Lion King might have led you to believe. Look how long this grass is. The warthogs basically disappear as soon as they walk into it. Oh, we're coming back the other way, are we? Why are we doing that? What's wrong, Mum? Yes, we're still here. But you knew that, so why did you come racing out back into the road? Did you just change your mind as to where you want to be? Or are you leading your family down towards Cheetah Plains Pan? Oh, this is a sounder of two females and their offspring. Obviously impossible for us to tell which ones belong to which mum. 
until we see them suckling. And even then there's recorded cases of aloe suckling with warthog babies. So it's difficult to tell exactly who's mom to these little ones. One of them looks slightly, sm two of them look slightly smaller than the other three. Now you might find it's a 3-2 split. And these females often join together to raise their piglets with a little bit of additional support and company and of course extra eyes. Now looking at the size difference between the two females it's clear that one is much older than the other and it's probably you'll find that this is a mother and her grown-up daughter and then their piglets all together in a group. Look at your hair! I know, those ridiculous little tails. They're like little whips. Three boys and two girls, I think. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Luz just said they look like little riding crops. It's exactly what I thought. Sorry, we don't mean to be insulting about your tails, but you have to admit they're a bit ridiculous. You can see that she's actually got a serious set of tushes, not just tusks. The lower tusks sticking out of her bottom jaw. And those are very prominent on her, and her daughter actually. And that of course is the part of a warthog that you really want to avoid. Even a lioness like the ones that Brent has just found would be careful when attacking a warthog so as to avoid being gored by those tusks. I love warthogs. I've always loved warthogs. I think <laughs> it was of course cemented when one of them tossed my little brother up into the air. Um, but I've just, I don't actually find them ugly at all. I wouldn't say they're as beautiful as a lioness or a leopard or a cheetah. But there's something beguiling about them. Don't you agree, Dave? They're so sweet. And this is such a cooperative family. Oh wow! Okay, now we're going to lie down in the middle of the road. Now oh, James, you say that you know that warthog... Sorry, there's alarm. Go away birds calling which is what caused her to stand up as well. Sorry, James. You said that you know that warthog piglets don't necessarily have the highest survival rate, and you were wondering if bush, piglet, bush pig piglets will be the same. I suspect you'll probably find that it is very similar, particularly in areas where there are lots of lions. However, a bush pig is actually quite a lot larger than a warthog and also quite scary. I've been chased by a bush pig before. It's probably one of the scariest animal chases I've ever experienced. And I have a friend who's been chased up a tree twice by a bush, angry bush pigs. So you might find that they're slightly better equipped to defend their youngsters. But I don't imagine that it's much higher than a warthog family in terms of their infant success rate. Here we go, look everybody's settling down for lunch. How sweet is this? One, two, three. All gathered together. When last did we get to sit with suckling warthog piglets? I don't think I've ever had it on a live safari. They're never quite trusting enough to be this relaxed. Me neither. Oh, Dave hasn't, Lou hasn't. I'm sure it has happened in the history of our live safaris. But it certainly hasn't happened with me. This is the first time I've seen this on our lives. Of, on, I think it's actually the first time I've seen it since I started working in the sands. What trusting pigs we have here. What a pleasure. Oh, everybody got a bit of a startle. It's okay, little pigs. No need to be afraid. We just want to sit and watch you.
<laughs> it's so cute. So it looks like it is a 3-2 split. Three piglets were suckling there. And then one with the other female, and then one that's completely distracted by grass. I don't want milk, I'm a big boy now. I'm going to eat grass instead. Oh, the other one's settling down. And you can see the big female seems to be the one who takes responsibility for leading them off. And as soon as she gets up and goes, the second female follows, and it's always been her leading. What you chomping? Is that nice grass? And well, you want to know what warthogs eat? Well, we have our answer there with a warthog with a mouthful of grass. They eat plants the fresh green shoots of growing grasses, tubers, they've got a very sensitive sense of smell and they will dig up things below the surface of the soil, roots, root systems of plants, tubers, so obviously those we get storage, the storage parts of the plant, like the equivalent of a potato essentially underneath the surface of the soil. They'll dig down and they'll pull those up. Interesting thing, never eat what you see, or never assume that what you see warthogs eating is safe for human beings' consumption because they have a completely different system that is capable of coping with toxins that ours is not. So you don't want to see a warthog eating a tuber and then automatically assume that it's okay for you to eat because it might not be and you'll find yourself getting very sick indeed. So they don't eat insects, they don't, well I mean they might eat an insect or two while they're feeding. Rachel, you would like to know if warthogs travel in packs like lions. I've just suddenly that put into my mind the idea of a carnivorous hunting warthog. And now the idea of a pack of hunting warthogs is actually terrifying. Uh, Rachel, they travel in sounders. That's the correct collective noun rather than a, a pack or a pride. They travel in sounders when it is breeding season especially. So it's very common to see two females together, often related, but not always, um, traveling with their offspring, just because it provides a little bit of extra, uh, a higher chance of raising their piglets successfully, or at least one of their piglets successfully. It must actually be terrifying to be a piglet right now, or a warthog, because imagine how easy it would be for a leopard to be hiding in this grass. Imagine you are... I don't know, not even two foot tall. Your eyes are a foot and a half above the ground. The grass in places is up to my armpits. Now imagine what it must be like to walk through that grass. <laughs> Waiting for a leopard to spring out at you. They will also eat meat like pigs. So pigs can be quite omnivorous in their diet. Uh, warthogs are not omnivores. They're herbivores, but they will supplement their diet by chewing on bits of carcass. Our little warthog family has been so obliging, but it is time for us to move on. So while we do that, let's go over to Taylor for an update. How wonderful is it that you've been able to spend such a long period of time with a family of warthogs? Now I'm sure those warthogs are struggling just as much as we are and the rest of the animals out here with the flies today. We have seemed to have picked up a whole lot and you were looking at the famous guari tree. I think we need some new branches because our ones from today, actually I just threw mine out the window, but you can see here every time that I was swatting, this was happening. I was losing leaves. Now typically they're not too bad at losing their leaves, but once they become quite dry and brittle, like when you stop the flow of nutrients on them, they tend to fall off quite easily. Right, let's get some more. Hmm, which is going to be a goodie. Here's one. No, oh, I'm tangled. Let me just put this cord away. That was perfect. pull off the branches. Now you may think it's that it's very very silly but it's like these flies have now learned when they see the branches they just fly away from us. They don't even cause havoc anymore. Here we go Brian I'll give you that one. And I'll have this one and then we will start the game of swatting. How many flies did you end up on this morning? Um, 
at least 107. 107? Well, that's much better than mine. I think I only got about 56. You're a lot better at swatting flies than I am. But we're on Gwari Pan Road at the moment. And earlier, when we were driving on Mamba, Sorry, I have a fly that keeps buzzing and trying to go up my nose, which is not great. Uh, I was saying to you how eroded uh, the roads have become. And we've actually been avoiding this whole eastern corner, sort of around Hippo Pools, Gwari Pan Road, and Yala Road North, just because they're not the greatest roads to dri uh, drive after a bit of rain. So we've had three days of nice weather. And believe how wet Gwari Pan Road still is. Now, and luckily no one has actually come driving on yeah? We must be the first in a very, very long time. Maybe we can check in Yala Road north and south and see how they're doing as well. But we're almost, oh hang on, don't fly Hornbill. There is a red-billed Hornbill sitting in the road having a dust bath. You can see there's lots of ants running around it too. Now I wonder if it is going to eat the ants. Look at the ants, you see how it's jumping on the tail? This is amazing. So what's gonna happen here? This, you get different types of things called anting. It seems to be also wanting to eat the ants and loosening up the soil a little bit. But often ants will climb onto the birds and it's called a process called anting. You get passive anting and active anting. So that was a passive anting. That ant crawled willingly onto the body of the, or onto the body of the bird and normally it will stimulate and uh, get rid of any sort of particles and things like that. Whereas the active uh, anting is where the bird physically very gently picks up the ants and places them on its feathers to help get rid of the debris. But this is a hard road. <clears throat> you can see how it picks the ground to try and loosen up the soil. It's not a very, very sandy spot, actually not a very good spot. The dust doesn't look too fine. So it's actually got to work very hard and loosen up the soil. Very much like how an elephant uses its foot to dig up mud or uh, to also loosen the sand so that it can, it can do the same thing. But all of this dust is going to suffocate all of the uh, all of the mites and things that are on its body. But it's not anting properly though. Normally when they do do anting, they go into a trance where they will lay completely motionless on the road. It's very hard for an ant to do the work that it needs to do when it is fluffing its feathers about. I don't know if you saw that ant earlier, it went flying. <laughs> it got flung straight off of the back of this hornbill. It's something very cool nonetheless to see. Something very special and unusual in the bush. I'll never forget my first experience of seeing a bird that was performing anting. I thought it was dead. It was just laying on the ground, not moving, but it had its eyes open. And then I looked closely and I saw that it was covered in ants and I didn't know what it was about. And so I went and asked, oh, actually no, I think I picked the bird up. This was when I was very young. And I shook all the ants off thinking that the ants were attacking the bird. But little did I know when I was younger that that's what was happening. What did you get there, grasshopper? Looks like it had something delicious. There's a lot of insects around at the moment. They definitely have come back after the last few days of rain, which is great, because there was about two days when we did walks. Oh, dung beetle, run! Run, dung beetle, quickly, that hornbill's going to see you, and you are going to be in a lot of trouble, because you will be a tasty treat. Hopefully the, the hornbill doesn't see it. Oh, no, it's turned. And they've got good eyesight, too. They've got those massive eyes. No, I think this is a lucky one. It's going to make its escape. And now it's disappeared. Hornbill, come out. We want to see what you're doing. You can just see it moving on the bottom right. There it comes out again. Isn't that wonderful? And now obviously I've learnt since that we do not pick up birds in general. But especially not if they're covered in ants because they are in a trance-like meditation state almost just relaxing. You can do it, beetle. You can do it. Oh no, this is a steep incline. I wonder if it's going to be as nimble as the ants. I wonder if it also could be slippery. Oh, it's choosing a very steep spot to go up. Come on, beetle, you're almost there. You're almost to safety. The hornbill hasn't spotted you just yet. Go, go, go. And it's walking away. I think that it's going to be fine now. Wonderful. And that's so cool. Let's go up a little bit further. I might get another view of this hornbill. It's actually very entertaining. Nope. He flew away, just flew up into the tree. Wonderful! That was such a cool little scene. But we're going to go across... 
<laughs> sorry, excuse me. We're going to quickly pop at uh, in at Buffalo Hook Dam and have a look what's uh, happening around there. But let's go back across to Brent. His adrenaline must be pumping today after leopards on foot and then lions. I wonder how he's feeling. Well, I'm feeling still quite excited, but. Oh, Craig, I wouldn't take any more steps backwards, otherwise you're going to repeat your termite mound procedure because there's a bank there. There we go. We don't want you falling, not with all these big cats around us. Now, so we found the lions. We've left a marker for, for Rexon to find them again. I don't want to spend too much time with the, those lions on foot. They are quite jumpy at the moment, the Nkormas, and I'd rather leave with her thinking that we hadn't spotted her. So what I did was I built an arrow out of sticks to show Rexon. Oh, what is that? on your lens. It's one of the grass seeds you've been eating, Craig. <laughs> Craig basically walks around and eats panicum, otherwise he gets hangry apparently. <laughs> now, so, Hosanna and Shungile ran into this area. I'm pretty sure they're, they're around here, close by somewhere. So, just want to double check on them, uh, just mostly for tomorrow morning so we know where to look. So, once we find them, we're going to move on. And there's been quite a lot of cysticular alarm calls and, and other bird alarm calls. So. And Herbie and I were discussing that they've either stopped in the thickets here or they've carried on onto quarantine where it's nice and open but we haven't heard any impala alarm calling on quarantine or anything like that so they could still be on the edge of the, the, the river system here. 